Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to our worship service today. I'm so glad that you joined us and I hope you will know the presence of the one who loves you so much as we worship him together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time and this opportunity to be gathered together uh, uh, virtually to worship our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do a powerful work on our hearts and on our lives as we worship you and we hear you speak. Uh, Father, I pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let me invite you to join us to sing, uh, to sing along as Aaron leads us in song. Well, we're completely online today because I need to be somewhere else this weekend. But let me encourage you to gather in person next Sunday at 10 a.m. As usual, you will need to let us know if you're planning on attending by registering on our website, mychurchfamily.ca. If you choose not to attend in person, let me encourage you to join us through the live stream on our website. At this point, I'd like to lead us to worship our Lord by returning to Him what God's entrusted to us. As usual, you can give in one of three ways. The first way is by mailing your giving to 162 Sherwood Road, Charlottetown, PEI, C1E 0E4. Or you can give by e-transferring cbcgivings at gmail.com. And finally, you can give by visiting our website at mychurchfamily.ca and by clicking on Give. Well, let's continue to worship by singing again. Lord, 
Hello everyone, I hope you were able to join us last week. Last week we looked at David obtaining victory over the Amalekites. This triumph and reverse in fortunes was brought about through David's personal faith in the Lord. And we talked about the importance of fostering a living, a breathing and dynamic relationship with the Lord that doesn't just come and submit to the Lord when there's a crisis and things get tough, but a relationship that is a lifelong. It's a commitment to Him that is based on love and submission. Today, we're finishing off the book of 1 Samuel, and we're doing it with a story that is sad and gruesome, yet at the same time, one that ends in hopeful expectation. Today, we look at the death of Saul and his sons. And so let me read for you from the last chapter of 1 Samuel, chapter 31. 
The Philistines fought against Israel, and Israel's men fled from them and were killed on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines pursued Saul and his sons and killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua. When the battle intensified against Saul, the archers found him and severely wounded him. Then Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and run me through with it, or these uncircumcised men will come and run me through and torture me. But his armor-bearer would not do it because he was terrified. Then Saul took his sword and fell on it. When the armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So on that day, Saul died together with his three sons, his armor-bearer, and all his men. When the men of Israel on the other side of the valley and the other side of the Jordan saw that Israel's men had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned the cities and fled. So the Philistines came and settled in them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons dead on Mount Gilboa. They cut off Saul's head, stripped off his armor, and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to spread the good news in the temples of their idols and among the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of the Ashereths and hung his body on the wall of Beth Shan. When the residents of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their brave men set out, journeyed all night, and retrieved the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan. When they arrived in Jabesh, they burned the bodies there. Afterward, they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh, and fasted seven days. We live in a world that has consequences, and we have rules and laws, both natural and man-made, that describe the consequences of our actions. For example, if I jump off the roof, the law of gravity is going to make sure that I fall hard and probably break a bone or two, or even worse. If I put my hand on a hot stove, I will get burned. If I go to bed at a decent hour, I will likely get enough sleep to wake up rested and refreshed in the morning. If I heat, eat healthy foods, it should lead to a healthy body. If I embezzle a million dollars, I will go to jail. Now, there are exap exceptions to all of these examples, but generally speaking, there are consequences to our actions. So my question for you today is, why do we live our lives as if there are no spiritual consequences to our choices and actions? Why do we live our lives as if there are no real consequences for our sin? Have we divorced the physical and the spiritual so much that the two never meet? The chapter we have just read gives us the tragic events and fate of Israel's first anointed king. Saul dies in battle against the very enemies he, had, he was supposed to subdue, the Philistines. His body is dismembered and desecrated in a way that seems terrible to us, but it was especially appalling to the Israelites. Finally, Saul's remains are retrieved and burned and given a humble burial. The description of Saul's death brings the contrast between David and Saul to a climax. 
Chapter 30, which we looked at last week, showed us David's success against the Amalekites. He rescued Ziklag and saved the lives of everyone who attached themselves to him. By contrast, Saul and everyone associated with him dies in this battle with the Philistines. Now this is what I want us to notice today. Saul's trajectory in life, his long and painful descent from Israel's first king with so much potential to the decrepit, neurotic, vengeful person he became who ends his life by suicide is the result of the tragic choices in life that he made. He had been anointed by the prophet and judge Samuel, and the Holy Spirit had come upon him powerfully to guide and direct him as the new king of Israel. God had transformed him into a better man, and he initially had great military success in defeating the enemies of God's people. But he slowly came to despise the very man who anointed him as king making it impossible for him to follow God's instructions for the nations. Ultimately, he rejected God's authority, and his life degenerated into pathetic bickering and jealousy, rather than saving his people from the Philistines. And rather than than saving his people from his enemies, Saul devoted himself to denying the kingdom to David. He eventually deteriorated into madness, and Saul's terrible death is due to his outright rebellion against the Lord. And here's the point. There are consequences to our actions, not just physically in this world, but also spiritually. Ultimately, this is a story of divine judgment. Saul reaps in death what he sowed in life. The Lord has departed, and the prophecy of Samuel through the medium at Endor is coming true. Saul is soon to die. In one fatal battle, he he loses his kingdom, his life, his sons, and his dignity. Divine judgment is a central concept in the Bible. It appears early in the New Testament when Abraham asks, Won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just? In the final pages of the Bible, judgment is God's ultimate act at the conclusion of human history. The Apostle John wrote in the book of Revelation, I also saw the dead the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. God is a God of justice. Judgment is essential to who He is. It's essential to His character. Throughout both the Old and the New Testament, God provides uh, and and proves who He is um, as being the God of justice. In fact, the psalmist says, Clouds and total darkness surround Him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of His throne. But I wonder if sometimes we think of judgment only as something that will take place in the future that on some distant day of judgment, God will make all the wrongs of this world right. And there's nothing wrong with that thinking. It's true. At the end of time, He will set everything that is wrong right again. There will be ultimate justice. For He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with His faithfulness. But do you know what? God's judgment is also a reality in the here and now. God uses circumstances in our own lives to get our attention, to point out that we've wandered away, 
to drive us back to Himself. The danger is that we harden our hearts so much that we miss the Father's gentle rebuke. And we can even attribute the Lord trying to get our attention through hardship to something else. We heard Josh Dockstetter preach a great message the other week on Psalm 95 that says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. We each have the potential to harden our hearts beyond the influence and grasp of our loving Heavenly Father. Paul puts it this way in the book of Romans. Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment is revealed. He will repay each one according to his works, eternal life to those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory and honor and immortality but wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. Be careful. Be warned. Could the difficulties you are facing right now be a direct result of sin in your life? Could it be that the Lord is trying to get your attention? Don't wait until it's too late and you're beyond the rebuke of the Father, because there is an ultimate judgment. Saul's life is an example of that. In the Old Testament, no one had the concept of eternal bliss or eternal punishment. And as a result, we find that in the Old Testament, people suffer the consequences of their sin in this life. So, setting aside for the, a moment the, the final judgment in the end at times, our story today reminds us that all of us do suffer the consequences of our actions sometimes in this present life. So the book of 1 Samuel ends in a cemetery near Jabesh with a group of faithful and loyal subjects paying homage to their fallen king. But the book also ends in expectation. We are not left on this theme of judgment without having hope. There is a quiet waiting, an anticipation, because 1 Samuel is not the end. There is a second Samuel. There is a second anointed one who is ready to fulfill his role in history and in God's plan. Just as this passage anticipates the coming of the Anointed One who will serve as the King of Israel way better than Saul did, it also anticipates the coming of His much greater Son. Next Sunday begins Advent, the beginning of our season of waiting and expectation, just as those who experienced the death of Saul waited in expectation for the next chapters of Israel's history. And we are about to begin our waiting for the Incarnation, for Emmanuel, God made flesh. And we continue to wait with expectation for the coming of the One who forgives and restores, but also judges. How about you today? Are you experiencing judgment on your life for the sinful choices you've made? If you are, return to Him. He is waiting with open arms. Would you bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, thank You that You are a good Father and that You gently rebuke and discipline Your children. Father, I pray that uh, we would uh, be confronted with the reality that there are not just consequences for our physical actions, but there are consequences for our spiritual choices and our sin, even in the here and now. Father, help us not to um, separate the spiritual world from the physical world so much that the two never meet. 
Uh, Father, I thank you that, that you use circumstances in our lives to sovereignly um, uh, bring us to yourself, to get our attention, to discipline us in order to um, uh, bring us into right fellowship and right relationship with our Savior. Father, I pray that if, if we are experiencing hardship in our lives right now, that um, we would take a moment to reflect and, and repent of anything that, that might do a disservice to being a child of yours. Father, thank you that you love us so much that you desire to get our attention in these ways. And so, Father, I pray that we would not harden our hearts. But, Father, that we would humbly bow before the throne of grace and receive the forgiveness that you offer through your Son, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Jesus, you're my hope. 